Let's pray. In the name of Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you who are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the first words you ever taught us is to repent and believe in the good news. Jesus, we can't do it ourselves. We need your grace to repent. So we ask you to open our hearts to receive that grace, that we may repent and surrender and be the men you created us to be. We beg you these things, Lord Jesus, in your most holy name, amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, what we're going to be doing this year is last year we dealt with a bunch of different things, but this year we're going to just deal with the 10 things, the 10 expectations of what it is to be a 2232 man. Now again, 2232 is what we call the formation we've had around here from Luke chapter 22, and it's the words that Jesus said to St. Peter when he says, I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. And after you have returned, you will strengthen your brothers. So what does that look like? So last year I went and I did a, a retreat outside of Memphis for a bunch of great men about uh, just a full weekend about what it is to be a 2232 man. And we put these expectations together. And so I'm going to just read you the expectations tonight and every uh, month we'll be dealing with a different one. Remember, we're going to be on the first Wednesday of the month now. But a 2232 man, the expectations of one is that he has repented and surrendered his life to Jesus. You know, so the complete Lordship of Jesus Christ, and that's what we're going to focus on tonight. The second expectation has a daily prayer life and is committed to the Holy Spirit because we can't live our life without the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it ourselves. We become Pharisees that go through the motions. The third has sacrificial love for family and tells them that they love them every day. So again, we've talked about some of this stuff last year, but sacrificial means that you put your family first. You're last, and you tell them that you love them every day. That's what men do. You're an active and committed member of a parish community. So you're not doing a Lone Ranger thing. You say, oh, I'm spiritual, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. That's garbage, gentlemen. Jesus always called people to community. There is no such thing as someone that followed Jesus without anybody else around them. That's a lie from the evil one. You can't do it alone. You need to be a member of a community, a parish, a church, somewhere. Why? So you can give. God does not call takers to be Christians. Me, 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 gimme, 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 me and Jesus. He calls you to be a giver if you're going to be a disciple. So 2232 man is one who belongs to a parish and, and, uh, and is active. Number whatever it is, four, one, two, three, four, five. He is in service to his church community and poor. So again, by being a member, a man who follows Jesus, you can tell that because he gives away his life. You know, and so he's in, he does, gives back to his church, he gives back to his community, and he makes sure he takes care of the poor. It's the last question I ask you if you ever go to confession me. Do you consistently take care of the poor? And people always say, I try. Oh, shut up. You need to do it. That's what a Christian does. The sixth expectation is strives to live a life of holiness and sexual integrity. <laughs> holiness and sexual integrity. That we don't have anything in the darkness. Everything's in the light. And we let Christ be Lord of our sexuality. We don't keep him from our sexuality. He needs to be in charge of it. Okay? Uh, it's accountable to another man. Again, Jesus sent people out two by two. He didn't send anybody out by themselves. And so the way that we... Uh, stay strong is when we have we're accountable to somebody else he is a man who tithes how much your money belongs to God all of it he says you give me 10 percent off the top it's not even it's not even negotiable <laughs> if you're gonna have, if Christ isn't Lord of your money he's not Lord of any other part of your life it's just that simple so the ninth thing is that he is courageously courageously proclaims the truth and love so he stands up for the truth of Christ but he doesn't just hit people with truth over their head he speaks it because he loves them. And they have to show, you know, you live a life of love. So when the people you're speaking the truth to, they know that. And then finally, is active member of a men's group. And again, we'll talk about that as in, in December. What does it mean to be a man who is with others, who comes together, challenges others, supports others, and lifts each other up? This, this Saturday, I'll be down in uh, Dallas, Texas. 
and we deal with about 800 men. And we deal with a men's conference there. And some of the speakers I'm speaking with are some great men. And so when we come together and we can pray and then we can sit there and talk to the, uh, the men who are there about them encouraging to come together. Because again, gentlemen, as I've said before, if you haven't got it yet, we're heading for war. And the war is going to be against the Christians. It's just that simple. And Christ is raising up men of God who are willing not to kill for him, but to die for him. To stand up for what's right. And easily in my lifetime, in the next five years, in your lifetime for sure, this is going to happen. And God is raising up the men to be strong so that we can deal with it when it comes. Mark my words, I'm not one of those nutcases. This is just as reality as it can be. It's coming God's raising us up to be ready. And so we begin, begin at the very beginning then. Jesus in Mark chapter 1 verse 15 says, the first words out of his mouth publicly, repent and believe in the good news. Now again, gentlemen, repentance, I have a good friend who's a Lutheran pastor and uh, he used to always say to me when we were both in seminary together, him in a Lutheran seminary, me in a Catholic, he says, you know, Larry, You Catholics are always confessing, but you're never repenting, huh? Because a lot of Catholics go to confession all the time. Used to be anyway. And I say, you don't don't get the theology. You cannot be forgiven unless you repent. So even if you're a Catholic and you go to confession and you say, I committed adultery. If you don't have a repentant heart, even if the priest gives you absolution, you're not forgiven of your sins. When Jesus calls you and me to repentance, he calls us to change our life. We can't do that ourselves, that he'll give us the grace for it, to not just turn away from sin, but to turn towards him. That's the good news, right? The good news is for God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, that whoever believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. That's the good news. But it comes from me first repenting, repenting of my sins, saying, these things are killing me, Lord. I'm not going to keep doing them. I'm going to change my life. So what has to happen is the intention. What is necessary for forgiveness is repentance. And that repentance means I will turn away from this and never do it again. Right? Now, most people say, I can't do that, Father. Then you're not a Christian. You don't sit there and say, I will try not to do it again. Because again, let's say I go up to Steve here, a nice guy here, does all the videos. And I come up to Steve and I go, hi, Steve. And he goes, hi, Father. And bam, I punch him in the nose. And he gets a bloody nose. And I go, Steve, I'm so sorry I punched you in the nose. I'm going to try not to do it again. And Steve's going to be awful excited. He's a saint. He's going to say, it's okay, Father, I forgive you. Whoa. I see him an hour later and I go, hi, Steve. And he goes, hi, Father. Bam! I hit him again. This time I break one of his arms. And I go, oh, Steve, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry I broke your arm. I'm going to try really hard this time, Steve, not to break your arm again. And Steve, being the saint he is, is going to say, that's okay, Father, I forgive you. What a guy. I see Steve an hour later, and I go, hi, Steve. And he goes, <laughs> hi, Father. Beat him up again. This time I break both of his legs, and I'm crying this time. Oh, Steve, I'm so sorry. I'm going to really, really try not to beat the hell out of you again. What's Steve going to say? I forgive you, Father. I don't think so. He's going to say, I don't trust you, Father. I don't believe you, Father. Because if you were sorry, what would I do? Stop being the hell out of Steve. So talk is cheap, gentlemen. I have seen when I taught the boys at prep, kids would cry crocodile tears of, I am sorry, Father, for what I've done. You're not sorry unless you stop. Now, in our weakness, we may fall. But so that means, so if you say something like, I miss Mass on Sunday or I miss church or I uh, swore, what does that mean to be forgiven? I'll never miss Mass again. I'll never swear again. I'll never look at porn again. That is what is necessary for repentance. Now, will you fall again? Maybe. But your intention got to be, by your grace, Lord, I won't. Not me. I can't. You leave this up to me, Jesus. Forget it. I'm done. But by your grace, I repent. So what that means is you no longer cling to the sin but you cling 
to Jesus. Huh? Now, this is necessary because our God is a God of justice, is he not? You know, God is a just God. So when God says, if you sin, you shall die, that's what he said to Adam, remember in the beginning? He said, if you sin, he said it to Eve too, of course. When he said to Adam and Eve, if you sin, you shall die. They sinned. So God had to send them out of eternal life. Right? If not, God's a liar. Now we know the devil is the liar, right? From the beginning he says, oh, you won't die. God, no, 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 right? Remember he, in Genesis chapter 3, where all sin begins, it's very clear here. This is the bad news when the devil comes and he says, uh, did God really tell you can't for me eat of the, any of the trees of the garden? And the woman said, yep, yep. God said we can't even touch it or eat it or we will die. But verse 4 says, but the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. So, gentlemen, somebody's lying. Either God's a liar, because if you can sin and not die, then Almighty God's a liar. Right? He said it. Or the devil's a liar. If you sin, you won't die. Hmm. Somebody is lying. So, Jesus called the devil a what? A liar from the beginning and the father of lies. So what's that mean? That if you and I embrace sin, then when the justice of God comes to punish the sin, and the punishment of sin is death, then we too will receive death because I embrace my sin. But if I repent of my sin, Jesus, I'm sorry I did this. I never want to do it again. By your grace, I will sin no more. And you embrace Jesus. When God goes to punish the sin, the sin will be punished. But mercy will be given to you and me. Because I embrace Jesus, I don't embrace the sin. So if you're one of those that say, you know, it doesn't matter what I do. Of course, it doesn't matter. God's a liar, of course. It doesn't matter what you do. You want to spit in his face right now? Did he die on the cross for no reason? He died to take care of your sin. And if you cling to him, you got that mercy. But if you cling to the sin, you're clinging to that what kills you. And the God of the universe is a God of love. So what does God do? He always gives you the choice. You embrace me or you embrace the sin. And I'll give you what you choose. So when I'm dealing with sin in my life, I got to sit there and make a responsibility. I, I have to acknowledge, first of all, that I sin because I want to. Right? I do it, I want to, I feel bad afterwards, but I want to and I'm in the midst of it, right? And so I am using it, I'm making a choice. So I got to make sure that I acknowledge, okay, the buck stops here. I don't sin because of my parents. I don't sin because of my girlfriend. I don't sin because whoever you want to blame. You sin because you choose to sin. Because if you don't take responsibility, then Christ can't forgive you because it wasn't your fault in the first place, right? So you and I got to take responsibility for our sin. I sin, right? And now that I've sinned, I am sorry and I repent. And there's two different kinds of sorrow, right? We've talked about this before. The first type of sorrow is sorry that I don't want to go to hell or I don't want to die or I don't want to get punished. Oh, it's enough, gentlemen. But really, you know, that's really, you should be perfect sorrow. It's God, I'm sorry because I hurt you who love me. That's what sorrow comes, is when I start seeing that what sin does. It kills me, it kills my family, and it hurts my relationship with God. It's like spitting on his face. I make grace cheap when I just say, it's okay, it doesn't matter what I do. Of course, God expects me to sin. Well, he does. But he gave you the remedy of sin, Jesus. And so that's why this first principle is not just repent. Because repentance isn't enough, you know, it's just, it's just not enough. But I have to surrender. I have to choose that I want Jesus to be fully in charge of every part of my life. Every part. My thought life, my money life, my sexual life, my physical life, all my family life. Jesus Christ, when I surrender it all to him, is totally then in charge. So one of the greatest things you and I got to do as we're reflecting tonight is you got to really think about what haven't you repented of in your life? Is there things that you cling to more than you cling to Jesus? Really? Why do you do that? 
Don't you ever realize when you're like, again, when I taught a prep, the guys used to sit there, nobody here. I don't think I have any prepsters here, but the guys I taught anyway. But what they would do is before they, even a prep, before they would come to class in the morning, they would smoke pot over in the parking lot. And here I am teaching, and as I'm teaching, the kid would be, you know, I remember one kid especially, sitting right there, and I'd say, so-and-so, did you get high this morning? Oh, fine. Don't you lie. You can tell when a person's high. I don't know if you knew that. And you're going, but anyway, they look like I'm stupid. <laughs> and the eyes all watery and no oh, father. And I says, isn't it a shame for you to like yourself? You got to get high, right? Or you got to get drunk. You hate yourself so much. You can't deal one day with yourself that you have to get something to help you numb the pain. And I said to him, don't you get it? What does that do but makes you a slave, right? All sin makes you slaves. We think that we're, think about those of you who are stupid enough, I'm sorry, that smoke. When you were a kid, everybody says it's cold to smoke. You'll be a man when you start smoking. Yeah. And you start smoking. Now try to stop. Huh? And it's killing you. Every time you inhale, you're saying, come on in cancer. Kill me now. Fill my body with yourself. Come on in cancer. Here's another one. Here, I'm going to help you. I'm going to make it even faster. Oh, yeah, come on in. And you try to stop smoking. Uh, uh. You are such a man, right, that you let one little stick run your life. You're not even man enough to give up smoking. You're a slave. You're a wimp. You let that determine, or let that be a drug, or, and you have your excuses for that, and all these things you have your excuses for, oh, I was bad at it. Stop it. You let something else control you instead of Jesus Christ. You become a slave to something, and you can't stop. That's never set you free. The only thing that will set you free is Jesus. But you keep making excuses for why you'd rather be a sinner and be a slave. When Jesus says, I want to free you from that. It's killing you. I know you can't do it yourself. Stop trying. Give it to me. Surrender it to me. And that's what I encourage you. If you're if you're if you're in a group tonight, and uh, you know if if you're at that place where there's people you know or people you don't know, and you say, you know, I have been struggling with drinking, smoking, whatever it is. Would you guys pray with me? that I'm released and set free from that. You could be set free tonight. You can. I promise. If you'll stop embracing that and stop making excuses for your sin and embrace Jesus. Because when you have Christ, he is in complete control of the universe. He can easily take control of your heart. But you got to surrender it to him. you got to give it to him. And you've got to hold nothing back. Why? Because if you hold anything back, you know, it just takes a thin thread to keep a bird from flying. Right? Just one thread. You tie it at the bottom of the bird's foot and you tie it to a tree. That bird can't go anywhere. But it's just one little thread. Yep. One sin that you refuse to repent of will keep you from being set free. Because that'll be the one thing, the I, anything, 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 except for this. <laughs> well, that thing is what's keeping you from being free. Huh? Now, it doesn't mean when we come to Jesus that we completely stop sinning. Boy, if we could do that, I would be ecstatic, right? There's every day I sin, every day I struggle, but every day I get up and I keep walking and I embrace Jesus. So it doesn't mean you're never going to sin. But there's some things you can be completely set free from, completely. Sometimes, most of the times, it's a process. You didn't come out of your mother walking, did you? Well, maybe a couple of you did. You came out of your mama, and it took you some time. And you fell, and you got up, and you fell. So even if you've fallen a thousand times, Jesus says you can't do it yourself, but I'm going to walk with you, and I'm going to give you the power to overcome it. You just got to believe that and take an act of faith in that. And then Jesus can do such great things. Again, way too often, gentlemen, we let our past dictate our future. There is nothing you can do about your past. Nothing. Then why do you keep letting it control your future? Why do you keep sitting there and looking back and Jesus says, stop it. 
you look at me. You look at me. You embrace me. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what your, uh, whatever your counselor says. You look at me. I will set you free. And that's the reality. So the very first thing we got to do when we come to Jesus is deal with sin in my life. No excuses for it. This is my sin. I've chosen it. We all have our own particular sins. And we keep going back to it like a dog returns to his vomit, as the scripture says. But you don't have to live that way. If you, Jesus, you need to take full control of my life. And that means that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Huh? That every day, the way you make that real is when you wake up in the morning, before you tell God what you're going to do and ask him to bless your life, you say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? And I'll give my life for it. I'll do anything you want me to do today. Huh? And again, everything, when you do his will every day and you seek his will before your own and before anybody else, that will will beget life in you, beget freedom in you, beget life in you, beget freedom in your family. If you're going to sit there and decide that every day I exist to do the will of my Father, to do the will of my Savior, to seek Him above all things. Gentlemen, most people in the world today live for themselves. Jesus says you give away your life and you live for me. And I will give you not only life now, but eternal life. Eternal life. And that means part of what it is, gentlemen, is you have to get the perspective of eternity. you got to make sure that you're focusing not just on this world, but forever. That you're focusing on what matters most as you and I go to heaven. Right? That you and I live forever. And what I do in this little time on earth determines where my eternity will be. And so again, God is all, you know, sometimes... Uh, there was a guy this this past week on, I read it on Facebook, of course, but this guy is a big atheist, and he was talking about why he's an atheist, and the guy asked him in an interview, he says, and so what if you find out when you die that you stand before God, and now you got to make an account? And, of course, the guy was still as arrogant as all miserable, and he said, I'll ask him why there was, what about child cancer, God? Oh, you really did a good one there, children having cancer. Oh, you're a great God. Oh, and I'm supposed to thank you every day, right? I'm supposed to thank you every day for the garbage in my life. That's what I'm supposed to do. And so he was sitting there, and he's looking at this God of eternity. He's going, I don't like the way you run this earth, because this guy, of course, would do it much better. But he doesn't get it. The God of the universe, when you want to look at something, you look at the cross. The God of the universe is one who gives everything for you and me. And then he says, you need to learn to do the same. So give away your life to me, give away your life for others, and then you're going to find life. And this world isn't just where it's at. The older you get, gentlemen, don't you get it? Some of you are just too young yet. But it goes extremely fast. Faster and faster and faster. Huh? I was talking to my kids once about this at prep with sophomores, and I was doing my, their retreat, and one kid raised his hand. I go, what? And he says, Father, this is all irrelevant to me. You little miserable. I said, oh, it's irrelevant, huh? And he goes, yes, I'll worry about this stuff when I get old. You know, like 35? Well, he's about 34 right now. And I said, so, you still an atheist? He goes, oh, no, Father, I've changed a lot. Yeah, once you start getting on this side, it's like, ooh, maybe there is something. Maybe there is a forever. And, and just as an aside there, gentlemen, as they with the atheist question, you do realize, by definition, an atheist can never know that he's right. Never! If he dies and he goes, to, he goes and there's no God, and he's in the tomb, he goes, ha, 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 I was right, I was right. You're dead, you can't even worry about it. And a Christian or a God believer can never know that he was wrong, right? He goes, after you die, you say, I was wrong. Because you'll be dead and it ain't going to matter. But the only thing a Christian can ever know is he was right. And the only thing an atheist can ever know is he was wrong forever. That's just reality. So, first of all, it's a gamble. You know, It's a gamble you can never win. And... The reality is that once we go beyond that stuff, you know, like even when I was sitting there and he was challenging me and thinking, okay, I love when someone gives me something opposite. I want to look at it. So when he was talking about all the things about God, or I've read lots of books on atheists, you know, about I want to know what they think and why. 
And then I want to deal with it. Because I'm looking for truth. I don't know about you gentlemen. I want truth. I don't want to believe in a fairy tale to make me feel good every day. I want to believe truth. And so Jesus is God or he's not God. Very simple. And so when I was a young person, that was the biggest question. Is Jesus real? And gentlemen, just like this guy wrote to me this past week and he says, you know, Father, I don't even know if God's real. I says, the only way that's going to happen is by what? You're deciding to spend time. Gentlemen, I can promise you Jesus Christ is realer than anybody else here. Since I was 17, which I'm going to be 55, I've spent an hour with him every day. I know him well. I don't know him enough, and I never will for all eternity. But I know him. And I've known what he's done in my life, and what he's done in the lives of people around me. Just something as simple as this church, gentlemen, I've been here, I just reassigned for six more years, but I've been here almost 14 years. When we got this church, it was falling apart. There was less than 300 people here on a weekend. Now we've put $2 million into this church cash, lots of kids, lots of things. We've grown significantly and we keep growing. Not because of Father Larry Richards. He's a jerk, ask anyone who knows him. It's because of Jesus Christ and the reality and the power That if you and I stop thinking about what we can't do and you start focusing on what you can do and let no one tell you anything different, huh? Your life can start to change. But often, even in my parish council once, I'm sitting there trying to get the guys, okay, we're going to do this, ladies and gentlemen. And everybody starts saying, not everybody, but, oh, we can't do that, Father. It's been tried before. And I says, I want you all off off, off a council. What? I never like to be told what we can't do because Jesus is telling us what we can do. And when you and I are embracing Jesus and surrendering our life to him and you and I are looking to the future, anything can happen that he wants to happen. See, the problem is when you say that anything can happen, you're saying anything that you want. That doesn't really matter. God really doesn't care. He has a plan for your life and for his will. If he just gives you what you want, okay, I'm going to win a million dollars. You're embracing yourself and using God as your divine rabbit's foot. you got to embrace his will for your life. Because he knows you more than you know yourself. He created you with a purpose. And your purpose will build up the kingdom of heaven. Not your heaven, not your kingdom. Because your kingdom, what's it going to do? So what, you become a millionaire and you die anyway. Ooh. But if you build his kingdom and you live your life for others and you embrace Jesus, then your life will be meaningful when you're gone. Because you gave more than you took. And you gave more than you took because you repented of living for me. And you start living for thee. Jesus and others. And that is a blessed life, gentlemen. And when you start living that life, your life becomes a blessing. And it becomes blessed. So you got a choice this night and every day of your life, of course. Will you do it your way or will you do it God's way? Repent of constantly doing things your way because, gentlemen, doing things your way gets us where we are. If you like where you're at, okay, keep doing it. But if you don't, okay, this hasn't really worked too well, has it? Hmm. Okay, Jesus, I'm going to start doing it your way. And you watch what he'll do with your life. But you have to completely surrender everything. So I encourage you in your prayer, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you anything you haven't repented of, you haven't fully surrendered. You can write it down, and then you can go through it with the Lord and say, Jesus, I repent of that sin. Lord Jesus, I surrender this to you. And keep giving it to him. As the Holy Spirit reveals to you more, you keep surrendering it to the Lord. Okay? Gentlemen, God wants to do great things in your life. The only one who stops him from doing that is you. Stop it. Surrender and repent. You got it? Get it? You gonna do it? Nature, no. No, try. Someone hit him. Try. (laughs) The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless, keep, and protect you. He who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.